Mushayad Hussain from London, and I'm delighted to present the second episode of Global South Voices on behalf of CGTN, China's premier television channel for the world. This program is dedicated to providing a perspective to our viewers through the lens of the Global South, representing the world's majority. In today's episode, we will discuss the democratic systems of China and the United States in the context of a world which is witnessing turbulence and transformation. And we are very honored to have three distinguished guests from three different continents. We have Fred Membe, president of the Socialist Party of Zambia in Lusaka. We have Keith Bennett, vice chairman of the 48 Group. And we have Einar Tengen, based in Beijing, who is the founding uh, partner of, uh, of, uh, of the China and Global uh, Network, Chairman of Asia Narratives, and also from the Taihai Institute. We will start with our agenda focusing on uh, people-centered versus capital-centered democracy, and I'd like to go first to Beijing to start with Mr. Tengen. Mr. Tengen, uh, you are also seeing uh, in Beijing the inter third international forum on democracy being organized, and the issues of democracy have become very relevant because in the West, democracy is often used as a weapon, human rights and democracy, to beat up countries that they feel are at variance with their perspectives. And uh, although we saw the study of Harvard University a few years ago uh, by the Ash Center, which said that uh, uh, in public opinion survey of China, over 90% of the people of China had expressed satisfaction with the Chinese political system. So given this context, how do you see uh, the perspectives being presented by the West about China and China's own uh, democratic development? Well, I mean, the, the, the issue of democracy is that it's a system. Uh, it's one system which is supposed to be able to deliver government. The uh, Supposedly, democracies are better at a transition of governments because the people can vote out the government uh, and they can vote in new leaders. But what you've seen, especially in the United States over the last 45 years, is that uh, the middle class, which is really the bulwark of uh, the kind of uh, democracy that's in America, has uh, literally come in tatters. Um, 45 years ago, it was 62% of the population were middle class. Today, it's 50% and going lower. So you have a situation where you know the idea was that, yes, democracy can deliver, but today it is not. If you look at uh, politics, and this is not only in the United States, uh, but democratic systems that are championed by the U.S., what, are they delivering uh, leaders? <clears throat> are they talking about issues that need to be talked about, like you know, the $34 trillion in debt that the, the uh, U.S. government is piling up and is about to pile up more? Are they dealing with uh, internal issues? Is it safe to walk the streets of the city? So democracy, in essence, is not failing the people, but the people are failing democracy. Now, you contrast that with China. They just recently had the two sessions. Uh, the two sessions were all about many, many ideas. What they did is they were concentrating on uh, jobs for kids, uh, the economic prospects. Uh, there were you know, literally hundreds of uh, suggestions made. Each one of those suggestions will be treated seriously and will be reported back on in terms of whether it could be done, what laws need to be uh, adjusted, what policies need to be adjusted. But all of the system in China drives towards uh, consensus. It tries to get everybody working in the same direction. And how do they do that? They do it based on values and this idea that no one is correct. It is just a question of how you solve uh, the issues. Very, very different from the U.S., where you have entrenched parties who are battling back and forth over issues uh, that they make into these huge um, bugabears, uh, whether it's abortion or uh, immigration, uh, uh, foreign policy, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, all the failed uh, issues out there, currently Gaza, of course, and Ukraine. I think very well put that uh, whether the system delivers and you have leadership that can solve the problems, and also whether uh, the leadership represents the voice of the people. I was seeing this uh, public opinion polls uh, regarding the war in Gaza and also in Ukraine, where majority of Americans want a ceasefire on Gaza, but the American government policy is quite different. Your take on it, Mr. Membe, uh, from Africa. 
uh, how do you see that? A, ca a country that tries to dominate others cannot claim to be democratic. A country that thrives on the exploitation, the humiliation of others cannot claim to be democratic. Mm. And a country that is dominated by others, that is humiliated by others, can also not be democratic. What is happening in Gaza is very clear. The majority of the world's population are against what is going on in Gaza today. But one country, with a few countries that surround it, that are with it, are defying world public opinion on Gaza. They are allowing thousands of people to be butchered every day, to be killed in cold, in cold blood every day. This is not democracy. As Lincoln said also, and correctly so, democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. It must be a government that arises from the people. And when, if we look at it that way, from the definition of Lincoln, you will see that what we see as democracy in the USA is nowhere to near to that definition. And China is much more closer to that definition. There is more participation in China than in the US in the governance of their country. So what we see in Gaza today is a reflection, is an extension of what is happening in the USA itself. Israel would not be able to do what it's doing in Gaza without the support of the United States. But where in the world has the United States really ever promoted democratic governance? Uh -huh. Where in the world? Show me one country in the world where the USA has promoted democracy. Not even within the borders of the USA itself can we say there's democracy. What we see in the USA is not democracy, it's a sham. That from 1947 to 1989, there were 64 attempts at regime change by the United States, mostly in uh, different third world or uh, developing countries of the global south. And uh, many of the uh, governments that were overthrown were democratic governments, whether it was in Iran in 53 or Chile in 1973. So you are absolutely right uh, that uh, it's not about, uh, for the U.S., it's their own security interest, not about democracy at all. No, ab ab absolutely not. And uh, I'd like to um, follow on really from what my friend from Zambia uh, was, was saying. And we see a, a huge uh, democratic deficit, I think, both in the individual countries in the West and, to, and also within international relations. Uh, how can it be democratic when the overwhelming majority of the countries in the world are demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, but one country can repeatedly um, veto that? That's, uh, that's not democracy, that's uh, a tyranny of one. And we see it reflected um, here in Britain as well. Uh, we have a situation where both major parties are supporting the genocidal war being waged in, in Gaza by, by Israel. Uh, and yet uh, over 70% of people in this country, in Britain, opinion polls repeatedly show uh, that this large majority of the population is demanding a ceasefire in, in government, both uh, in, in Gaza. The, the government and the two major parties are quite out of sync with public opinion. So clearly for some people in Britain, if you vote the wrong way, democracy itself uh, is, uh, is alarming. That is the key message because when it comes to their core interests and if the people take a decision uh, a popular opinion is against the interests of the, whether it's the British establishment or the American establishment, then uh, it's not uh, seen as a democratic choice. Uh, also, I think that uh, it also reflects the foreign policy priorities of these countries, Mr. Tengen, because uh, we see that uh, uh, contrasting narratives are being presented. China talks of a community of shared future. America talks of America first. And the mindset is more uh, black or white, zero-sum game. And it's not, uh, as you said, based on consensus. And uh, these foreign policy choices are now being exercised 
in a world which is multipolar, requiring a multilateral response, while the Washington playbook is still stuck with the Cold War of the Soviet Union days. Yes, I, well, I think it was best expressed by Blinken when he said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, <laughs> this is a, you know, <laughs> something that goes, harkens back to uh, you know, the colonial period where you know, basically countries would just say they discovered other countries, although there are people there, and you know, start carving them up as if they were you know, just some sort of uh, turkey uh, for dinner. Um, the, the, the fact is, you, you hear all of these countries, the U.S., uh, Great Britain, everywhere, they talk about illiberal democracies. And it's something banded about when it's always talked about, uh, with, especially with Putin and other places. Um, but the, you know, the fact is, this is exactly what they're doing. And the hypocrisy is what is killing uh, all of these uh, countries who say that they uh, you know, believe in international law, they adhere to international institutions, uh, you know, they, they believe that uh, uh, there are human rights. Well, right now, the emperor has no clothes. Uh, consistently, you see uh, governments run by elites uh, who are you know, basically uh, you know, <laughs> tweedledee and tweedledum in, in most cases, especially on this Gaza issue. And, uh, you know, they're, they're ignoring it. They say, well, this isn't a plebiscite. You know, we know better. There are big things uh, involved. It's complicated. Well, it's always simple when they want something, and it's always complicated when they're supposed to do something. It's kind of like the $100 billion a year that was supposed to be given to uh, developing nations to help address climate concerns. That was supposed to start in 2020. What's happening in the world today is you have elites who are failing the people. They do not, they represent special interests. In order to solve this, you need to have systems which are actually responsive. And I don't mean that you take a plebiscite on every single issue, but there should be some basic norms. I mean, China has proposed three things, that there should be a security, global security initiative that makes sure that countries are secure and that their security doesn't depend on the insecurity of others. They propose that there be a development initiative, that countries have to have a way of developing. And they've appear, uh, said that they need a civilization uh, initiative, one that brings respect and understanding of the different cultures in the world, instead of treating them as if they're you know, uh, pieces of a, some sort of animal that needs to be carved up and consumed by the developed and dominant nations. Um, it's not just within these countries. Uh, globally, we're mm -hmm. undergoing changes. There's, you know, with the uh, digital world, uh, so much is changing, uh, robotics and things like this. We're undergoing a major change, but somehow there's a resistance, especially in the, the, uh, for, you know, the currently dominant and uh, politically, uh, economically, and certainly militarily dominant uh, countries. And, you know, the, the irony is that they're failing themselves. So to wean away Africa from China and from their natural allies, how do you see the Western role in this context at a time when uh, uh, the world requires a response that is based on uh, cooperation and consensus rather than a new Cold War mindset that seems to be predominant in Western policies towards Africa? Uh, for, for us, for a very long time, we lived in a world where only their security matters, mm -hmm. only where their development matters, only where their better lives matter. Yes, they have the right to seek their own security, but they must let others also feel secure. Yes, they have the right to develop. But they must also let others develop while seeking their own development. Yes, they have the right to live better, to aspire to live better. But while aspiring to live better themselves, they must also let others feel secure. We believe that the highest level of political thought was reached when some human beings realized that or became aware of the fact that the experience, the knowledge, the fruits of that intelligence of each, of, of each human being should reach all others. 
and that no human being had the right to be a wolf, but to be brothers and sisters to all others. This, in our view, is the essence of the work that is going on in China today. Seeking a world where all feel secure by cooperation. Seeking a world where all develop by cooperation. Seeking a world where all can aspire to live better through cooperation. Win-win relationships. <laughs>
Yes, uh, Mr. Tengen, and I was also seeing this report of the uh, U.S. intelligence community. It's called the Annual Threat Assessment, and they devoted a largest number of pages to China, the so-called Chinese threat containment of China. So it seems the U.S. strategic culture is still based on that old view of the 19th century, the Monroe Doctrine, spheres of influence, hegemony, ensuring your own diktat, and in search of enemies. How do you view that, Mr. Tengen? Well, yeah, absolutely true. I mean, uh, we, we saw that in the uh, 70s, what they did to Japan. Remember that in 1986, uh, Japan signed the Plaza Accord. Uh, in, t in today's dollar terms, Japan's uh, economy is worth less today than it was in 1986 when it was in essence forced to sign that. Uh, everything that the U.S. is saying about China today was said about uh, Japan. You had uh, members of Congress and Senate uh, bashing uh, Toshiba radios and, and uh, Toyota and Honda cars. Um, and it's just this sense in America that no one can be trusted uh, and only uh, America should be in control. Uh, this was a kind of post-World War II mentality uh, where they said, we can't trust the Europeans. They always get us into trouble. Uh, we can't trust the rest of the world because we're basically racist. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to be in charge of everything and we're going to take whatever we need in order to uh, finance that. And, and basically, they became an uh, economic colonial power. Um, the U.S., you know, really has this sense that uh, it is anointed. Uh, and this was positioning the U.S. for being a morally uh, right, also uh, biblically right. Uh, and therefore, uh, there's no arguing. Uh, you know, <laughs> truthfully, the Chinese prefer somebody uh, like Kissinger uh, because, you know, he, he deals in a real power facts. You can make a deal with somebody like that. Uh, you might not like it. You might not like uh, what they're doing. Um, but... Uh, you can arrive at a, some sort of conclusion. Uh, when you're arguing with somebody who believes that they're right and you're wrong, uh, there's nothing you can do. And uh, China is now stuck in what they call the philosophical prisoner's dilemma. You have an overwhelmingly powerful, militarily powerful nation, which is uh, routinely threatening you, uh, forming alliances against you, making it clear they're uh, they're looking for an opportunity to have one of their minions uh, attack you and try to weaken you and uh, prevent you from rising economically. This is the old playbook uh, that we've always used. Um, but it isn't working. I mean, the difference between the 70s and today is that China, over the last uh, eight years, has been rising at uh, an average rate of 6.5%. Uh, the U.S. has been rising at 2%. And this is really the crux of what Amer uh, that worries America, is that it is losing, that it's losing its edge. Uh, they're fearful that China represents the kind of example that will push other nations uh, to not only speak out, but to take action. And this is really what frightens both Europe and America, that you'll have consortiums of countries coming together and not you know, begging anymore, but saying, this is the way the price is going to be. Um, and this is really at the crux of, of China's rise. It's not just China itself as a competitor. It's what China represents. It's what you know the Middle East represented with OPEC. And this is really truly frightening because it would uh, oversee the transfer back of the wealth that was stolen. And, you know, we only have to look at what is now called India understand that when the British arrived, that, that area was 24% of the world's GDP. When they left, it was 4%. So clearly, uh, there needs to be changes. But clearly, uh, those countries that benefited from the, their colonial past don't want to recognize that. I think that's the key thing, that it's the fear of China is not just based on China's peaceful rise, but it's also what, as you said rightly, Mr. Tengen, that what China represents today. And I was recently reading this uh, report of the Harvard University by Professor Graham Allison. Uh, it, uh, it's called The Great Tech Rivalry, China versus the United States, where he says uh, China is overtaking the United States in high-tech manufacturing, whether it's and the issues of artificial intelligence, 5G, robotics, cloud computing, STEM. 
So I think that uh, a non-Western power rising peacefully uh, is something which is not acceptable. And uh, Mr. Member, that uh, this Chinese path to development which irks the United States, so it's not about uh, public opinion or the interests of the people, it's about U.S. interests and they determine what are the interests of the recipient country. Mr. Mbembe? It's impossible to continue to live in a world where the interests of the United States reign supreme. What we have today is a choice between China and the United States. What we have today is a choice between a, com a, a community being built with a shared future, a world that is being constructed with a shared future, or America first. Is that a choice? There's no choice there. What we have before us today is a choice between common security or American security. It's not simply a question of following China blindly, no. We fully agree with the path that the, China, the Chinese people are pursuing. Absolutely correct. And that's why the Chinese track record is different than the West. China has not risen through any uh, occupation or colonization or aggression or interference or armed aggression. We know what happened to Petrus Labamba in 1960 when he tried to uh, raise the flag of uh, Congolese independence. Uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, uh, when it comes to international relations, the credibility gap is very pronounced. The blatant hypocrisy was too stark uh, when compared with Iraq, with, with Palestine, with Syria, with Somalia, with Libya, and, and with, with, so, with so many other countries, and, and the global south, which is feeling increasingly emboldened because of the peaceful rise of China, and because of the development of BRICS, because of the Belt and Road Initiative, and, and so on, that the global south said, said no. And the second, uh, the, the second um, major change has, has, been, uh, has been with the conflict in Gaza, when the whole world uh, can see that all the fine principles uh, that the United States espouses uh, count count for nothing in its in its determination to to side with Israel, even if it places itself in almost unprecedented isolation within the international community. And by the international community, here I mean the real, actual, actually existing international community, not the fictitious one. Uh, that's comprised of, of the leaders of the United States and the leaders of, uh, of, of a couple of other countries. And, and I think that uh, if you look at uh, Xi Jinping's uh, Party Congress reports, in both the 19th and the 20th Party Congress, he, he said that socialism with Chinese characteristics offers a new alternative or point of reference to developing countries, to other countries that wish to rapidly develop their economies while maintaining their independence. And I think that this is a fundamental factor in, in, in impelling the rise of the Global South. And, and the rise of the Global South is not per se directed at the countries of the West, in, in, in my opinion. It's, it's if the West chooses to stand in its way, if the West refuses to enter the 21st century in terms of equitable multipolar relations be between countries, uh, then the West will find itself rejected and isolated. Uh, but that is the choice. That is the choice of the West. I think that's the important thing: the shift in the tectonic plates of geopolitics and geoeconomics in the world, where the global center of gravity uh, is shifting from the West to the East. And uh, we are seeing this historical change, uh, where the center of gravity once in the West, now the rise of the global south. With that, we come to the end of this episode. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on CGTN app, YouTube, X and Facebook. I'm Mushayad Hussain. Thanks for being with us. Please stay tuned to Global South Voices, CGTN's debut program for Global South countries. And look at today's world from a different perspective. See you next time.